I'm Chris Page. I'm a customer solutions architect with Apigee, part of Google Cloud. Today we're going to talk about maximizing microservices, um, how to leverage the integration between Apigee and Istio. And for this topic, we're going to start, start talking about a little bit what is a service mesh, if you're not familiar with that. Why would you need, what is Istio? Why would you need Istio for that service mesh? And then we'll talk a little about API management for those that are, of you are not familiar with it. And then I'll get into a nice little demo so we can show off the integration between the two. So, why service mesh? Everyone loves microservices, right? That's the latest and greatest thing. You decouple, um, decouple that business logic and you are able to build out independently deployable and scalable services. Now, what does that look like? When I have a couple teams, I start building out different components of that application, things get a little chatty. You know, it's great when you start off with one application. What happens when you have lots of applications? What happens when you have an entire enterprise that has thousands of microservices? They need to communicate between each other. How do you handle monitoring? How do you handle testing? And how do you understand which team is authorized to communicate with those other microservices? So are they really awesome? Oh, nah, they might not be. Microservices are ter terrible. But that's where Istio comes into play. So what is Istio? Istio is an open source uh, uh, service project that was um, combined from IBM, Google, and Lyft. It's an open framework for connecting those interoperable services between your, within your service mesh or with, within your containerized environment. There, there's a couple of different components of Istio that make it um, valuable for those containerized environments. One is observability. So being able to identify all of these services within your service mesh, being able to trace and provide visibility of the health of those services, Understanding the agility for operational, how to deploy multiple instances of those different services within that application environment, being able to do canary deployments, um, A-B testing, and allowing a, a control plane that manages all of those deployments for those, those services themselves. And then finally, policy-driven security. Istio is built from the ground up for providing um, TLS authentication between service to service for not just encrypted for two-way mutual TLS communication between those services, but also for the authentication authorization. So service A can only talk to service B and C and vice versa. All of that is going to be policy driven by YAML configurations. There's a couple components that make up the Istio platform. Um, first is the pilot, which is that central control plane that allows you to push the communication to all of the individual components or the individual policies. They have the mixer, which is the enforcement point. Um, it's a flexible plugin that allows different providers to build off and extend the capability of the entire service mesh. And then Citadel, which is the CA, or the Certificate Authority, that provides that mutual TLS between services and the authentication authorization between those different services. Now, under the covers, uh, Istio runs on top of Envoy, which is a sidecar proxy built by Lyft. And Envoy actually is embedded in each one of your, your service pods, so it handles all of the communication between the services. And the best part about it, all of these features are abstracted out away from the developer. So they don't need to worry about it anymore. It's now all handled by the platform itself. So how does it help? When I mentioned A-B testing, you can have the same service be deployed multiple different versions, different tags of that service, and then you control routing based off of um, percentage um, for load balancing between version one or version two. You can have um, different um, regexes or matches based off of HTTP headers. So different audiences may want to receive a certain version as you release a new release into the, your service mesh. You can have multiple different policies or multiple different um, rules applied as you start introducing those new features within your service mesh. Now, that's great. We have that inter-service communication that is handled by Istio, and we can manage all of that, those deployments, the 
the observability of all of the services and all of the security. But what about API management? Now, API management um, it allows you to expose all of those services to all of the consumers in a secure, reliable fashion as well. And with API management, and Apigee specifically, we like to focus more on the developer's experience. How the developer can onboard those services in a centralized management fashion through our developer portal and provide visibility into your, your API services or your API products. Now, we have a, a full list of features um, within our API management platform, but we like to focus on three main themes, and that is that developer ecosystem, providing that one-stop shop for developers to go to learn about those services through our developer portal. And we consider those API services as consumable products. So within the enterprise, you may have multiple different microservices. You might have multiple um, RESTful APIs. You might have different uh, legacy SOAP-based services. All of them may make up one uniform service that would be applicable to different connected experiences or different channels of the consumption model. Um, we have a full-fledged monitoring and analytics, so being able to provide all the um, operational metrics of your platform within your API ecosystem, understanding um, different SLA management or the different rate limits that you apply for those particular products, as well as driving more insights into um, where your business team should focus on what is successful from the consumption of those API resources and what is not successful. And then the underlying layer is your traditional API gateway or um, API services layer. And we have a managed offering, a self-managed, as well as the integration Istio that I will talk about now. So why Apigee with Istio? Well, that's a great question. Um, so Apigee leverages that Mixer plugin so that you can do things like OAuth and job-based authentication for your services, media mediation transformation, quota enforcement, as well as driving the analytics from all of the consumptions within your service into a unified platform. And Apigee built, um, you know, Istio is open source, as well as the Apigee um, uh, Istio Mixer plugin that we built. So all of those, those features and all of those analytics um, in the bigger picture, they, they're gonna span multiple different services across multiple different providers and multiple different technologies. So with Apigee, we provide that uniform interface for, or uniform facade for all the consumer channels, whether they be in the public cloud managed within Istio, or you're building out applications in various cloud services, or what if you have still legacy applications and you're trying to transform them and modernize them, you know, breaking up the monolith, which is, it comes back to the beginning, what we're doing with microservices. So, Today, I'm gonna to show you a quick demo. Um, I'm gonna walk through, basically, I have a service mesh, um, I have a, a, a beer API service, and I'm gonna actually enforce authorization and quota enforcement for those beer APIs. I'm gonna walk through what a developer experience would look like consuming those services outside of the mesh, and then I'm gonna you know, do a little bit of uh, the A-B testing and provide some visibility with our analytics. So, give me a second. This is an example of what my, my beer service mesh looks like. Um, I have two, two services, and I have a, a, a detail service for the beers, and I have a review from the beers, and those services are running in within my service mesh within GCP. So I'm going to um, start consuming those services and then enforce authorization on them so that I actually have to generate an API key and generate an OAuth token to gain access to that. So let me jump into there. So, uh, give me a second. So, this service I have a, uh, it's running right now. There's my sample beer API service. And um, I want to get the documentation for that, that service, so I'll actually go to my developer portal. You'll see that um, within Apigee we have um, a, 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 a rich interface that allows you to customize based off of the different API catalogs that you're going to provide for your services. So if I want to learn about the documentation of that beer service, I can actually go in here and start understanding all of the URLs, all of the, the documentation via open API specification, and I can say, okay, so there is that endpoint, and I can start consuming beer. So let's go back, to, let's actually launch my, my application. It's a single, single page app. 
um, running in uh, one of the popular JavaScript uh, notations. So if I go and tr try and actually get beers, I don't have my configuration. So I'm just going to plop in my, plop in my uh, API endpoints. Let's just save that. OK, great. I'm getting some data back. There's no uh, authentication, no um, authorization right now. I can, I can search, I can sort, I can do a bunch of things. Now, with the integration that we built into um, uh, uh, Istio, um, we basically enforce a rule within that Mixer plugin so that all of the services that I, I'm, I'm trying to consume right now will have that rule applied based off the credentials of the application that I need to create. So that rule actually looks just like this. It's more YAML-based configuration. It's an Istio rule. You can see I can have different match settings. So I'm looking for all inbound requests to my default namespace. And then I'm actually going to enable an analytics rule. Um, so all of the inbound requests on the default namespace are going to be sent up into my analytics platform. And the entire application uh, looks like this. So if I do my good old kube control, You'll see I have all my services running, um, my deployment, my pods, and all of my endpoints for that particular service. One thing to note here is each one of the pods is actually has two containers. So if I do kube control pod, oops. You'll see, uh, oops, let me get my deployment. Hold on one sec, to my deployment. They'll actually be um, the Istio, the Envoy, or Istio Mixer that's deployed with each one of those pods. So that's actually going to do the enforcement as I push that configuration to each one of my pods of my service mesh. So let me apply that, um, that inbound rule. Now once that takes, I'm actually going to go and try and consume my service again. Let's just do a quick refresh. I automatically get a permission denied. So let me try and go from my application. I got a 403, permission denied. So I can't access that service anymore. So as a developer, I want to create an application and start gaining access to that. I need the credentials from that application. So let's go back to that developer portal. I'm going to go actually and sign in, and I'll get, uh, create a new application. Let's go here. I already have an existing app, but let's just create a new one while we're here. If I can spring one demo app. And I want to get, I have two, two different products here. And one product actually has a, a pretty strict quota of 10 requests per minute. So if I sign up for that, that product, I'm basically going to get, you know, um, firewalled from all the requests once I enforce it. But let's, let's do that anyway, and then I can show you um, once you enable an additional quote if I needed to step up. And let's say I'm a developer, I just want to test out um, integration into the service mesh, and I just want to have a small little subset. So let's try the first product first, or the, the, the sandbox product. I click Create. Um, it's automatically going to create the credentials for that application. So let me copy them, go back into my, my settings, Add that in here. Go back to my, oop, let me just log in. I'm going to do a, let's just do a simple test user. And everyone loves Jot, so let's get a Jot token. You'll see that um, once that refreshes, um, I am I'm the issuer. Here is my, my end user. And here's that application that I just created, Spring One Demo App. So let's try and go back to my application again. And there we go. Now I'm actually authenticated um, with OAuth, and then I'm calling into my, directly into my service mesh. Same functionality still applies. I can filter, I can get um, different results, and I can bring all that back. Now let's go back to the second use case that I was talking about was what if I introduce a new feature? Now, I have some Python and some Go I'm running MySQL and Elasticsearch, but latest and greatest, let's do some gRPC. Might as well. Let's just add some then likes to my new app. I, I, liked, I want to see how many beers that are liked. So I'm going to introduce this new feature as a new version in my beers API. 
but I'm only going to restrict it to a particular user base. I'm only going to restrict it to the um, users at abc.com. Well, in this case, I'm going to do um, google.com. So let me go back to what that policy looks like. And give me a second. I'll just type it out. So if I actually um, pipe out that, that configuration, you'll see that I'm, I'm, I'm leveraging a, a basically a headers match um, on the particular user ID um, so that I can apply a, a filter or an A-B testing to introduce, and I'm going to route to a version two of my beer API whereas everything else is just going to route to v1. So if I go back into my instance, and I'll log out of the test user, and I need my Google, I need to be a Google client, so give me a question. All right. All right, let's go back. Let's use, uh, let's log in with my credentials. So a third party IDP, we're using Google. And I need to do my two-factor authentication. There we go. All right. Now I have an ID token from Google as a third-party IDP. And also I have a new JOT that was generated from my OAuth provider. I go back to my beers. And now I'm getting a likes column. So now I'm actually hitting V2 of that, that beers API. And I can do the same filtering and everything and go back and start consuming those services. But if I'm a little chatty, you'll see I only had 10 requests per minute. That V2 is actually gonna go and hit that likes API pretty much for all of the beers that I'm trying to query. And I had a pretty restrictive quota, so I'm gonna get a, an HTTP 429 or too many requests. So I can go back and as a developer, I'm like, all right, now I'm, now I'm hitting my, my quota for that particular beer API within the service mesh. Let's introduce uh, the silver package that has thousand requests per minute. That's, that's a more on my speed right now. I'll go back here and I'll save that. And I'll take a minute for the, the API quotas to refresh. But while, that hap while that's happening, let's actually go and take a look at the analytics that are captured um, within the Apogee portal. So within our management API within Apogee, I can gain the insights of, let me just sign in here of all of those communications between the service mesh for my beer API. So if I go into and just change my environments. So I can actually start seeing all of the traffic coming from each one of my individual services. If I look a little bit longer from today, because I ran a couple of the instances, you'll see every single service that's coming in. All of the individual services within that service mesh that I applied that rule to, now all of that traffic and all of like the response time, you'll see if I sort this, I've got, um, I'll get rid of my OAuth endpoints, but I have my beer API, my front end, or my front end, my beer API defaults and the likes. And with you know gRPC, we're doing a lot faster than some of the other uh, technologies that I chose from. But within Apogee, you can expand all and understand each one of those products. So beer API itself, you'll be able to gain insights into that. You'll be, gain insights into individual service. And you'll be able to gain insights into the developer eco ecosystem as you start um, modernizing or breaking up that monolith into microservices into a containerized application. So if I go back to my beer app, let's just do a quick check. I should be all right, and nah, I think it didn't take, but um, that's pretty much it. Um, I saved a little bit of time for Q&A. Did anyone have any questions? Oh, one second. Go ahead. Right here? 
So Istio is going to be the enforcement or the, the service management of all of my services, so enforcing that, those policies that I created or those rules so that the security between each one of those services um, has mutual TLS, has the authorization, so the Beers API can only talk to details and reviews, the V1, V2 can only can talk to all three. So Istio plays like the central control plane for all of that service-to-service -service communication. Any other questions? How would you contrast this against the uh, Apogee micro gateway? How would I contrast this against the Apogee micro gateway? Um, so with our, Apogee has a micro gateway that's been, um, that, that is a hybrid configuration and it was built on Node.js a few years ago and it leverages a plugin-based um, policy enforcement. It still relies on Apogee as the central control plane for the proxies and the product development, but we actually saw um, the open source community heavily adopt with Istio, and we saw a lot of different use cases, managing um, like a, a central CA within the service mesh for that mutual TLS between services, and allowing a lot more of the um, uh, request uh, traffic management between A-B testing and uh, like uh, canary deployments. So there's gonna be two different applications or two different use cases, and right now Apogee is um, backing both of them. Question. Not today, no. It's not. Okay, so then uh, the Istio resources that you were showing when you were doing the Git deployment and showing us the, the YAML file, mm -hmm. um, those, were those manually created? Or, uh, how, yeah, how did you... So those, those um, right now, I, I created them manually okay. just for this demo, yeah. but you would leverage um, like, a, like a container services management within GCP or, or another type of product that manages all of those configurations so that they can be deployed. Right now, Apogee is not managing that, okay. um, but there are definitely other products that will. So uh, were you creating rules through Apogee that, was, that were being added, to, or were you just, um, or, or was that not happening at all? I just created the rule to apply the Apogee mixer and enforcement. Right, okay, yeah. so Apogee does, it has like a plug uh, A plug-in. Plug or adapter or something like that to Istio, right? Correct. Okay. All right, cool, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Is there any support for GraphQL? Um, not in Istio today. Um, Apigee supports that through, yes, but not in Istio. Awesome, any other questions? Um, so I've, there are, I mentioned this is open source, so we have if you go to apogee.com or github.com um, forward slash apogee and just search for Istio, we have free trials that you can sign up for. Um, you also can look at the integration. There's a couple demos of how to take advantage of that mixer plugin. <coughs> There's a booth downstairs that um, some of the other solution architects can talk about that integration as well as the integration that we have into PCF. Awesome. I'll be around for a couple minutes, so if you guys want to have any other deeper questions, I'll be happy to help. Thank you.